All right, gonna tell you, today we're gonna talk about some of the non-insect invertebrates and then we're gonna go into evolution and biogeography in chapter two. So some of the non-insects we're gonna talk about um, are listed here. I'm just gonna go into it. I don't need to say them again. You'll hear them as I talk about them. So the first are Nideria and Platyhelminthes. So jellyfish um, and uh, hydra. So jellyfish, um, we have aquatic forms of hydra here and they contain hydrocysts for protection. This is a flatworm in the um, group Platyhelminthes. They can actually ingest the hydra and retain undischarged hydrocysts on their own bodies for defense. So that's one way they're connected to each other. Um, they're not really connected uh, phylogenetically. They're not like very related, but there are other species of aquatic flukes, tap, um, things like tapeworms um, and schistosoma is a human parasite that it's a flatworm that's passed through snails. So in systems where people rely on fresh waters and they might come into contact with snails, they can get into their digestive system and cause schistosomiasis, which is a really nasty disease. Um, so, you know, if you want to learn more about this, so some flatworms are actually human parasites. Okay, so some, a lot of nematodes are also parasitic. Here we have nematoda and nematomorpha, which is a horsehair worm. They're round, unsegmented worms. Um, nematodes can be some human parasites. So for instance, river blindness attacks people's eyes and causes them to go blind. It's actually caused by a nematode that's passed through a black fly, fly bite. I was talking about black flies and how they bite you uh, last week. Um, nematomorphs are horse hair worms, really long round worms, and um, they can create zombies. So I told you I was gonna talk about zombies, nature zombies. Is an organism acting strangely? Is it doing things it wouldn't normally do? Is it willing to put itself in danger? Um, so that's exactly what this horsehair worm does. So it infects a cricket. This is literally how much of that horsehair worm was inside that cricket. It's disgusting. There's a really cool video you can watch of a cricket that basically is infected with this horsehair worm. And it's, you know, doing normal cricket stuff. And then all of a sudden it's like, no, I have to find water. And it walks to the closest water body and it throws itself into the water. And then the horsehair worm starts to come out of it because the horsehair worm has hijacked the cricket and convinced it that it needs to go commit suicide in the closest body of water because that's where the horsehair worm needs to be next. Um, okay, so yeah, a really crazy parasite um, that creates a zombie out of a cricket. Here we have the phyla mollusca. So things like gastropods are snails and limpets. Some snails are right-handed, some are left-handed, some are ram's horn shaped or planorbid. And then we have freshwater limpets too, basically just like marine limpets, but uh, freshwater. They tend to mostly be grazers. Some are detritivores. Um, this is a New Zealand mud snail. It's a really nasty invasive species. It's taken over Capitol Lake downtown. And I've started to find it um, in streams at Mount St. Helens, which is really disappointing. So there are also zombie snails out there. Um, this is Kanab amber snail, um, found in only a few locations in the Grand Canyon. Other species of amber snails are, um, are basically affected by a parasitic flatworm. Um, and the flatworm gets into the snail and then it gets into the eye stalks and it creates these weird projections that make it look like the eye stalks are these pulsating insect larvae so that birds fly down and attack the snail and get the larvae in their own bodies. So a lot of these parasite stories or zombie stories are about the parasite getting from one host into the next. And there's another really awesome video you can watch um, if you go below. All right, so the phyla mollusca also includes things like bivalves, clams and mussels. Here we have a zebra mussel, fingernail clams, and these are little tiny baby clams called glochidia. Uh, most mussels are sedentary filter feeders, um, but if they were just filter feeders, 
and sedentary and they let their little babies go into the water, the babies would float downstream and each successive generation of mussels would end up further down the river. Eventually they'd be in the ocean. So they had to devise a special way to get back upstream. So these little mussel babies hitch a ride on fish and they clamp down onto fish gills. And while they're catching a ride on the fish, they suck the blood out of the fish. So here, there's a really cool video you can watch um, showing how mussels have adapted to this kind of hitching a ride on fish by creating lures made of their own body tissue that look like the fish they're trying to capture or that look like the prey of the fish that they're trying to get their gill babies onto, their, sorry, their uh, glochidia. So here you can see some fish gills with the, the freshwater clam babies clamped down onto the gill and they're sucking blood. So they're basically little vampire babies. So did you know that mussels sucked blood, right? And clamped onto fish? No, you probably, well, maybe some of you did. Some of you have had me in class before. I like to tell this story. All right, moving on to the phylum Annelida, um, aquatic earthworms and leeches. Again, some nice vampire-like things like leeches on this fish. Um, here's a leech with a bunch of its babies carrying it around. We also have aquatic earthworms like oligochaetes, and some of these oligochaetes like to attach themselves and feed on um, their parasites of crayfish. So a lot of um, disease are caused by annelids too. So some of these parasites cause whirling disease in trout. Um, and if you have a system, a stream with a ton of oligochaetes, it tends to indicate pollution and low levels of oxygen uh, in the water. Moving on to bryozoans and tardigrades. Bryozoans are called moss organisms. They're these sessile, colonial, gelatinous, kind of snotty things that cover, you know, piers and rocks along rivers. Um, but they're organisms, they're colonial organisms. They just happen to look like snot. Um, and then moss piglets, um, that's a common name for tardigrades uh, or water bears. And they can withstand severe desiccation. They are often associated with mosses, but they can also live in the benthos and the bottom of streams. Okay, I spent the first lecture talking about the phylum Arthropoda, um, but there are some arthropods that are non-insects, okay? So arthropods have jointed legs, okay? Pod meaning foot, um, and things like arachnids, water mites, and spiders are non-insect arthropods. Columbulans or springtails are also non-insect arthropods. Um, there are truly aquatic mites. Most aquatic spiders though are not truly aquatic, but they kind of carry bubbles of water around with them like this diving bell spider. Basically they're scuba divers. They bring their own air with them. And there are both aquatic and terrestrial springtails. And then we have crustaceans. They're also arthropods. Okay, they have jointed legs and things, things like crayfish, amphipods, isopods, tadpole shrimp. Um, a lot of them are important detritivores, so they eat detritus, okay? Um, and then there are zombie scuds. So scuds are, are these little guys, amphipods, okay, little crustaceans, but they can be infected by the spiny-headed worm and here you can see a scud with the spiny-headed worm has this red spot. And what happens is that once they're infected by this um, worm, they stop, you know, kind of rooting around in the detritus in the bottom of a stream and they start swimming up near the surface and bouncing around, showing off this red spot where birds and fish will then prey on them. And so this guy is trying to get into a bird or fish host. So another zombie, right? So parasites can create these zombies that make, make the organisms do something they wouldn't normally do. Um, so they infect a host. Sometimes they alter the host's body shape. Often they alter their behavior. And then the behavior then benefits the parasite, usually to the detriment or death sometimes of the host. Um, and then the parasite gets to reside in its next host. So parasites often have these complex life histories where they need to be in two or more different hosts over their life cycle. 
And the last um, crustaceans I'll talk about are zooplankton. They're tiny little crustaceans. They tend to float in the water column, more commonly found in lakes and the ocean, but sometimes found in rivers as well. Um, their carapaces are made of chitin, but also of calcium, which is true for all crustaceans. Um, they often have eggs that are resistant to drying out or desiccation. Okay, so some really cool different kinds. We have clodosterans, copepods, and then ostracods, which look like little clear jelly beans, but then they open up and have little legs. So adorable, right?